The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of CDC's One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health Updates call on May 4th, 2022. Next slide. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash 2022 slash may.html. Next slide. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Identify an implication for human, animal, and environmental health. Identify a One Health Approach strategy for prevention of public health threats. Identify a One Health Approach strategy for detection of public health threats. Identify a One Health Approach strategy for responding to public health threats. List two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health care team. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash continuing education. The course access code is zohu webcast. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by June 6, 2022. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash zohu slash 2022 slash may.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov of slash TC online by June 7th, 2024. Please note that due to delays from the RACE program, we are still awaiting approval for AA SVB RACE accreditation for webinars beginning in April, 2022. Once approved, learners will still have a full 30 days to obtain CE. Next slide. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Casey barton Barabesh, director of the One Health Office, will share some news and updates. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Laura, and greetings, everyone. Welcome to the May Zohu Call webinar. We appreciate you joining us. Before our presentations kick off, I'd like to share some updates, and you can find links to these resources in today's Zohu Call email newsletter. If you're not yet subscribed, just use the link at the top of our main Zohu Call webpage, and you can access these resources. Our response to the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve, you can check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources, including information about keeping people as well as animals safe and healthy. Next slide, please. 
We just wanted to share some quick updates on COVID-19 in animals. Currently, there's no evidence that animals are playing a significant role in spreading COVID-19 to people, but we do continue to see a variety of different animal species reported with SARS-CoV-2. In the United States, we're tracking 388 animals that have been reported to date, including companion animals like cats, dogs, and ferrets, animals in zoos, sanctuaries, or aquaria like hyenas, large cats, a binturong, a fishing cat, otters, gorillas, and others, production animals like mink, and also wildlife like white-tailed deer and mule deer. And we'll hear a little bit more on white-tailed deer later in today's call. Cases of SARS-CoV-2 in wildlife have been detected and confirmed positive in 25 states. And there have been 18 mink farms that have been affected by SARS-CoV-2 in the US to date across several states. The latest animal case numbers are available on the USDA APHIS website and guidance for pet owners, mink farmers, and many others are available on CDC's website. Next slide. You can find links in today's newsletter to several recent publications, including transmission of SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant from a fully vaccinated human to a canine in Georgia. And other publications listed in the newsletter include arsenic in private well water, and birth outcomes in the United States. Next slide, please. And there's data modernization, making environmental health services data more accessible. And next slide. We've shared links to several new resources, including the One Health High Level Expert Panel Annual Report for 2021 and the APHIS 2021 Annual Impact Report. Next slide. There's some events and observances of interest. Lyme Disease Awareness Month is happening in May. And this week, May 1st through the 7th, is National Pet Week. So be sure to show off your pets on social media. Next slide, please. Continuing to highlight events and observances, May 20th is Endangered Species Day. And on June 7th, there will be an AMR exchange webinar called Antifungal resistance, understanding this growing global threat. Next slide. Finally, the Coronabacter and powdered infant formula outbreak investigations and the Salmonella outbreak linked to pet bearded dragons are still ongoing. You can visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past US outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. We appreciate you sharing the Zohu Call website link with your colleagues from human, animal, plant, and environmental health sectors and letting them know about the live webinars, video recordings, and free continuing education. Our next Zohu call will take place on June 1st. So please send presenter and topic suggestions for future presentations and any news from your organization that you'd like for us to share to Zohu call, Z-O-H-U-C-A-L-L -L, at cdc.gov. Now I'll turn the call back over to Laura, thanks. Thank you, next slide please. You can submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You can also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. Next slide. Our first presentation, Brasella Canis Overview, is by Dr. Maria E. Nicron. Please begin when you're ready. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. Today, I will be giving a quick overview on Brasella Canis infection in humans and, and animals and, pro and let you know of some of the work that our branch here at CDC is doing to address some of the knowledge, knowledge gaps in the field. Next slide. Brucellosis is a bacterial zoonotic disease that affects humans and numerous animal species, including dogs, of course. In general, brucellosis is considered, considered one of the most common and economically important zoonotic diseases globally. The cell wall polysaccharide, or LPS, is in Brucella species is classified either as smooth or rough based on the presence or the absence of the O polysaccharide chain. Smooth Brucella species contain the O chain, while rough Brucella species do not. This classification is very important as commercially available serological tests for humans 
do not identify an antibody response to rough brucella species like brucella canis or brucella abortus RB51 strain. Next slide. Brucella canis primarily affect ducks and it's believed to have a worldwide distribution with a prevalence ranging from one to 35% based on studies published. Um, when you look at the prevalence of canine brucellosis in the United States, there is um, the study suggests that the disease burden in the canine population ranges between one to 8% with southern states generally having a higher disease prevalence that is closer to 8%. However, as you can see in this map, the studies that are looking at the disease burden in the canine population in the United States are somewhat clustered and a little bit biased in terms of the distribution. Next slide. The incubation period for Brucella canis in dogs is difficult to determine because dogs may be asymptomatic or have non-specific clinical signs. Bacteremia in dogs can be detected as early as one to two weeks after infection. Canine brucellosis is considered a reproductive disease presenting as abortions and stillbirth is in female and sperm abnormalities and inflammation of the prostate, testicles, and epididymis in males. Dogs may also be asymptomatic despite having intermittent bacterial shedding. Non-reproductive signs are common in both males and female dogs and are generally non-specific. Dogs may present with any of the following regardless of their reproductive status. Regional or general lymphadenitis, discospondylitis, uveitis, splenomegaly, lethargy or exercise intolerance, anorexia, weight loss, or present with poor hair coat. Female dogs can shed the bacteria in aborted materials, vaginal discharge, urine and milk, and the shedding can continue for up to six weeks after reproductive failure. In infected males, the bacteria can be found in semen, seminal fluid, and urine. Next slide. Serologic testing detects antibody response against Brucella cell Envelope antigens and can be an important tool for ruling out the disease in dogs. RSAT, or rapid agglutination test, is an example of a screening test typically used in practice and the AGID or agar gel immunodiffusion and, of course, bacterial culture are examples of confirmatory tests. And culture is also considered confirmatory tests. Sorry. It is important to note that serologic testing can be negative during the first few weeks of infection regardless of the presence or absence of bacteremia. Radiography or CT is typically performed in cases of suspected discospondylitis, and MRI can be performed in cases of suspected meningoencephalitis. In general, canine brucellosis is considered a non-curable disease and treatment is generally unrewarding, as this bacteria has the ability to sequester in cells for long periods of time making it challenging to successfully get rid of the organism with antimicrobial therapy. This likely leads to relapses and intermittent shedding of the bacteria for months to years, even after clinical signs appear to resolve. Treatment can mask di diagnostic testing, which has shown to be a major contributing factor in the perpetuation of the disease. There are limited treatment options to treat this disease and owners should be aware that this will require, that treatment will require serial testing, long antimicrobial therapy, and also quarantine considerations should be taken into account. Next slide. In humans, people typically become infected with Brucella canis after direct contact with infected dogs or during infectious birth products, aborted materials, or vaginal or seminal discharge, urine or milk. However, keep in mind that low concentrations of the bacteria can also be found in the blood, saliva, nasal secretions, ocular secretions, and feces. And in, con in contact with any of these could potentially serve as an additional source of infection to people. Once, in once infected, people present with nonspecific non clinical symptoms and signs that are similar to those observed during infections with other Brucella species. 
infected individuals typically present with flu-like symptoms and may have one or more of the following symptoms, recurrent fever, chills, sweat, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, fatigue, anorexia, or weight loss. As I mentioned before, commercially available serology testing for people who are suspected to have a Brucella canis infection is currently unavailable. Serologic testing, such as the standard agglutination test, or SAT, or the Brucella microagglutination test, BMAT, they are commercially available, or ELISAs, can provide presumptive evidence to infection for to only smooth Brucella species like Brucella suis, Brucella abortus, or Brucella melitensis. Thus, when suspecting to have a Brucella kinase infection in people, isolation from a clinical specimen, in other words, doing culture, is currently the only definitive way to diagnose the infection. If Brucella canis is suspected as a cause of the individual symptoms, it is recommended to collect clinical specimens prior to starting therapy. And when submitting sample for cultures, it is very important to notify laboratories that Brucella is part of the differential diagnosis so proper precautions can be taken. Treatment is the same as for any other Brucella infections. So for uncomplicated infections in humans, Oral doxycycline and rifampin for six weeks is the treatment of choice. For more information, you can refer to the brucellosis um, reference guide that is available on the CDC website. Next slide. In terms of surveillance, brucellosis in humans is a reportable disease in all 57 reporting jurisdictions in the United States. Cases are reported to state and territorial jurisdictions when identified by a health provider, hospital, or laboratory. However, the causative Brucella species may not, may not be explicitly reportable in every state or jurisdiction and requirements may vary. Canine brucellosis is reportable to state officials in most states but, but status and legislation may vary. Next slide. Now, um, for the next few slides, I will talk briefly about some of the current work that our branch is undertaking. Next slide. One of our projects is the development of a Brucella Canis reference guide, similar to the one presented here on the right, side that was developed by our branch for Brucella species in general that is available on the CDC website. The goal of this new document, particularly for Brucella canis, is to serve as a reference document for background information on B. canis infections in peoples and dogs, and to provide resources for potential and confirmed human exposures to animals that have been diagnosed with canine brucellosis. This document is intended for local, tribal, territorial, or state health and ag departments, veterinary and animal health professionals, and also dog owners. Next slide. So taking into consideration our target audience, with this document, we attempt to make publicly available answers to questions that we receive on a regular basis, like for example, exposure scenarios, following contact with an infected dog. Um, this will follow the similar approach to um, in our existing reference guide, the laboratory exposure guidelines that include different categories like minimal but not zero, low risk and high risk exposures. Um, this document is still in draft form, so it's not publicly available yet. Um, at this point, we are going through one last round of internal and external reviews so we can begin the CDC clearance process. Next slide. As I mentioned throughout our presentation, through my presentation, there are no commercially available serological tests to identify antibodies against Brucella canis in people. Thus, for, with this project, our immediate goal is to first develop a serological assay that will be able to detect antibodies against Brucella canis in people, with the ultimate goal being 
better understanding of the human humoral immune response to rough brucella strains like brucella canis or brucella abortus RB51, and also understand the frequency of exposure to rough brucella in the United States. Next slide. In order to answer these questions, we are currently um, recruiting people with known exposures to rough brucella species or patients with a rough brucella species positive culture results. Um, if you want more information, do not hesitate to reach out um, to our branch to bspb at cdc.gov or to call um, our branch phone number 404-639-1711. Next slide. So to wrap up, canine brucellosis is endemic in the United States and brucella infections are likely underreported in both humans and animals. Treatment of canine brucellosis is in, in treatment of canine brucellosis in dogs is considered unrewarding and owners must be aware of a potential risk of transmission in spite of treatment and the potential cause of these infections as dogs will likely require recurrent treatment and testing. The lack of commercial serological tests that detect antibodies against brucella canis in people should be taken into consideration when recommending post-exposure follow-up and when attempting to diagnose an infection when brucella canis is suspected. If you're interested to know more about any of our projects or have any additional questions, do not hesitate to reach out through our branch mailbox or to myself. And that's all for all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Next slide, please. And next slide. Thank you. Our next presentation, investigation of an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 infection among African lions at Utah's Hogle Zoo is by Drs. Heather Olchin and Erica Crook. Please begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heather Olchin, and I'm a zoonotic disease epidemiologist with the Utah Department of Health. I will be presenting alongside Dr. Erica Crook, who is the Director of Animal Health at Utah's Hogle Zoo. We will review our investigation of an outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 infection among African lions and zoo staff that occurred in October 2021. Next slide. Animals in zoos and rehabilitation facilities haven't escaped the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Zoos have become a predominant One Health interface for zoonotic SARS-CoV-2 transmission, with infected animals detected in over 30 countries. As shown here, a diverse range of animal species have been infected, many identified here in the United States during last year's Delta surges. The outbreak we will review today involved African lions, which are among the most frequently reported infected species in the US. Dr. Crook will now describe what took place within their lion pride last October. Next slide. Utah's Hogle Zoo currently houses a pride of five lions, three females, which are two sisters and an offspring, and two males, which are brothers, all between five and 10 years old. The female and male lions are housed separately from each other. They are in separate indoor holding areas during cleaning and feeding with a shared airspace and approximately 10 feet between them. Zoo policy in place since the start of the pandemic requires staff to wear masks at all times while working indoors. Prior to the lion outbreak, husbandry behavior training took place daily with most lions which required close contact through a barrier. Next slide. Zoo staff first noted signs of illness in the lions on October 13th, when Calliope, a female lion, was slow to eat. We began saving fecal samples from the lions the following day. Over the next week, all five lions developed mild signs of illness, primarily sneezing and coughing. On October the 20th, we collected nasal swab samples from four out of the five lions. One of the female lions did not allow voluntary nasal swab sampling due to her demeanor, but the rest of the lions allowed bilateral nasal swabs while eating meat 
off of a food stick. Next slide. All fecal and nasal swab samples were confirmed to be positive for SARS-CoV-2 via PCR testing at the National Veterinary Services Laboratories. This included the initial fecal sample collected the day after lion calliope's first clinical signs. The length of clinical signs in the lions ranged between three and 20 days, and all five lions made a full recovery. Dr. Olchin will now review the human cases in this outbreak and the investigation. Next slide. Here you can see a calendar from last October showing events from the start of this outbreak in the Lions, which Dr. Crook just reviewed. Three individuals who work or volunteer at the zoo tested positive for COVID-19 around this time. Person A tested positive on October 17th with symptom onset the day prior. Person B tested positive on October 18th with probable symptom onset October 17th. There is some uncertainty around the true cause of person B's symptoms, as this person believed their symptoms were due to allergies. Person C tested positive on October 21st with symptom onset the same day. Next slide. The Utah Department of Health was informed of a confirmed SARS-CoV-2 outbreak at the zoo on Friday, October 22nd. The investigation that followed was a true example of One Health and required collaboration between many diverse partners. Our response had four main efforts. We held a COVID-19 sampling event at the zoo for testing of zoo staff members, initiated whole genome sequencing of positive lion and human SARS-CoV-2 samples, conducted interviews with zoo staff and managers, and performed an environmental assessment of the lion exhibit. Next slide. Our COVID-19 sampling event took place at the zoo on October 27th, one week after the lion nasal swabs tested positive, and two weeks after lion calliope's first sign of illness. A Utah Department of Health testing team collected nasal swabs on 10 zoo staff members. This group included all remaining zoo staff who could have had close contact with the lions in October. PCR testing was performed at the Utah Public Health Laboratory and all 10 people were negative. Next slide. We submitted all of the positive PCR samples for SARS-CoV-2 whole genome sequencing. This included four lion samples sequenced at the National Veterinary Services Laboratories and samples from persons A and B, which were collected prior to our sampling event and sequenced at the Utah Public Health Laboratory. Person C tested positive through antigen test only and could not be sequenced. Next slide. All six samples were of the Delta variant substrain AY.44 and were highly related. This phylogenetic tree displays lions as yellow dots and humans as green. Three of the lions and person A had completely identical sequences. Person B and the fourth lion each had one single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP when compared to the larger group. When the sequences from persons A and B were compared with the Utah population data, there were two community samples from mid-October that clustered within one SNP of the Hogle Zoo outbreak, shown here with red arrows. We investigated these two individuals, but neither reported any connection to the zoo or to zoo staff. Next slide. These results confirmed that the lions and zoo staff were infected with a highly similar viral strain. The discovery of matching community samples without an epidemiologic linkage to the zoo suggests that this strain was circulating within the Salt Lake City area at this time. Next slide. We interviewed the three positive zoo staff and the 10 who tested negative at our sampling event. Of these 13, none reported a known exposure to COVID-19 outside of work and all were fully vaccinated. None of the negative staff reported experiencing COVID-like symptoms in the previous month. Next slide. Interaction with the lions during the month of October was a main focus of our interviews. Of the three positive individuals, only person B had close contact with the lions, which we defined as being within a distance of six feet for any length of time. 
This person was a primary keeper for the lions, and in the 10 days before the animals developed clinical signs, person B cared for them on all but three days, indicated here in yellow. Person A did not work directly with the lions, but did prepare their food on October 4th and 14th. Person C did not have close contact with the lions or handle their food. Next slide. Apart from person B, two other keepers had close contact with the lions in the 10 days before their first clinical signs, person D and person E. Person D cared for the lions on October 8th and 9th, which is four and five days before lion calliope's earliest clinical signs. Person E cared for the lions on October 12th, the day before the first sign of lion illness. Both tested negative at our event and did not report recent COVID symptoms. Next slide. Using interview data and a zoo work schedule, we identified three notable interactions between positive staff members. On October 11th, person B and person C were both working in the same section of the zoo. On October 12th, person A and person C had an in-person conversation at the zoo. And on October 14th, person A and person B worked together in the kitchen area of the Lion Building, shown here. Next slide. While at the zoo, we conducted an environmental assessment of the lion exhibit. One of our primary goals was to assess the risk of SARS-CoV-2 transmission between zoo visitors and the lions. The main public viewing areas for the lions are fully behind glass. All viewing areas that contain air permeable fencing require visitors to be over six feet away from the lions. And according to zoo staff, the lions rarely spend time near these non-glass viewing areas. We therefore believe the likelihood of viral transmission between the lions and the public is low. During our visit, we reiterated the importance of infection prevention measures, such as enhanced PPE for staff, limiting contact with the lions, and avoiding high pressure washing of lion enclosures to prevent aerosolization of virus. Next slide. After finishing our investigation, we came to several conclusions. First, that it is unlikely persons A, B, or C were the source of SARS-CoV-2 exposure for the lions. Lion calliope displayed clinical signs before each of the known COVID positive zoo staff members developed symptoms. It is important to note that person B attributed their symptoms to allergies. If these symptoms were truly caused by allergies and not by COVID-19, the dates of their infectious period would be unknown. Next slide. We considered the infectious period for COVID-19 to begin 48 hours before symptom onset. If we assume that person B's symptoms were due to COVID, they should not have been infectious during their noted interactions with other positive staff, since both took place more than 48 hours before person B's symptoms began. The same is true of person C. Person A may have been infectious on October 14th when they were working with person B, but not on any dates prior. Next slide. Despite everyone's best efforts, we were not able to definitively determine the source of this outbreak. We suspect that the lions may have been infected from an asymptomatic zoo staff member that our investigation did not identify. Considering the timeline, person D is a possible source. This staff member worked directly with the lions four and five days before Lion Calliope's first clinical signs. We know from our partners in CDC's One Health office that the average incubation period for SARS-CoV-2 and other lion infections has been around five days. Person D did test negative at our October 27th event, but they have no earlier test data. If they were infectious as early as the 8th, they could have cleared their infection prior to the 27th. Next slide. An unidentified asymptomatic staff member could have infected persons A, B, and C as well. It is also possible that person A infected person B when they worked together on October 14th, or that the lions infected person B on one of the five days that they had close contact during the animal's estimated infectious period. 
It is important to note that while we cannot rule out lion to human transmission, we do not have enough evidence to show that any of the human infections in this outbreak originated from an animal source. Dr. Crook will now discuss the zoo's sampling of the lions to monitor viral shedding. Next slide. Since the start of this outbreak, zoo staff collected regular nasal swab and fecal samples from the lions for PCR testing. Nasal swabs were collected every two to three weeks for four months for a total of seven collections. In PCR testing, lower CT values represent a higher viral load. For this reason, this graph displays inverse CT values for each lion over time, so that a visual decrease corresponds to a decrease in viral load. Actual CT values from the first samples on October the 20th ranged between 16 and 19. Viral load then decreased to a plateau for about three months until all lions tested negative on February the 8th, 2022. This shedding duration of three and a half months for all of our lions is significantly longer than the average shedding time of SARS-CoV-2 in humans. Long-term fecal monitoring and whole genome sequencing results are pending. I will now turn it back over to Dr. Olchin. Next slide. In the spirit of this call, I want to end by highlighting some positive One Health outcomes that resulted from this investigation. The Utah Department of Health organized COVID-19 vaccination events at the zoo for zoo staff members and their families to receive boosters and for children following the vaccine rollout for five to 11 year olds. The department also assisted the zoo in establishing a COVID-19 testing program for staff caring for snow leopards, a particularly susceptible species. Fecal samples collected from the lions throughout this outbreak are currently being used to validate SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing for animals at the Utah Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. And finally, Utah's Hogle Zoo will be a collaborator in a federally funded project to establish zoonotic SARS-CoV-2 surveillance in Utah. Next slide. We would like to acknowledge the many One Health partners that contributed to this investigation. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our final presentation, SARS-CoV-2 Infection of White-Tailed Deer Public Health Implications is by Dr. Suresh Kuchipudi. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Laura. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the CDC One Health Office for this opportunity. Um, I serve as the Director of Penn State Animal Diagnostic Lab, which is part of the tripartite Pennsylvania Animal Diagnostic Lab system in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm also part of the Center, of, uh, Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics at the uh, Huck Institute of Life Sciences at Penn State. Next slide, please. I'm going to briefly talk about some of our recent um, research looking at uh, natural infection of white-tailed deer with SARS-CoV-2, and then highlight what are the public health implications of this um, ongoing exposure and circulation of SARS-CoV-2 uh, among animals in general, uh, particularly white-tailed deer, and highlight the One Health approach um, and its importance to tackling SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. So it's important to recognize that um, this is not the first time we had um, a coronavirus causing human uh, epidemic or pandemic. Based on the previous um, human coronavirus epidemics, what we understand, especially from the SARS 2002 and the uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome uh, in 2012, a, a coronavirus that circulates in a natural host, such as um, a bat or a, or a rodent, will undergo uh, interspecies transmission, meaning the virus from the natural host will jump and infect an intermediate host. And when the virus circulates in such intermediate host, because of close proximity or exposure, the virus will then make another jump, which is the animal to human transmission. And that results in the um, infection in people and subsequent spread will result in an epidemic or a pandemic. And um, a, a zoonotic virus that emerges from an animal reservoir and eventually infects people and, and circulates among humans 
is also likely to um, infect susceptible animals when they are in close proximity or exposed to an infected uh, human being. And we have seen uh, such examples with the previous coronaviruses. Next slide, please. With the SARS coronavirus 2, now we learned um, that uh, the virus can infect a whole range of uh, domestic and wild animal species. And particularly because the, um, the receptor for this virus is the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor, which is widely uh, distributed among many, many animal species. And therefore, the ability of the virus to bind to the ACE2 receptor of animals with its spike protein provides the opportunity for this virus to infect many more uh, hosts. And now based on all the information, we, uh, we know that the virus SARS-CoV-2 can infect many animal species and has already demonstrated um, several natural cases and also experimental evidence of um, infection of animals. And this observation is consistent with the, with the hypothesis that SARS coronavirus 2 uh, has uh, the zoonotic origins, uh, which is consistent with the, with the hypothesis that a zoonotic virus is also likely to infect susceptible animals when uh, they are in close contact with uh, infected humans. And the figure shown on the right-hand side of this slide also highlights the many different potential hosts that are either uh, confirmed by natural infection or experimental um, evidence, or some of them are also predicted to be susceptible um, by computational methods. So this list keeps growing. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk about a retrospective study we performed in, in Iowa to investigate the um, uh, exposure of white-tailed deer with SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. So uh, just to highlight why we, uh, we focused on white-tailed deer next, um, is that there was a first evidence based on um, computational prediction that many animal species have been predicted to be susceptible and white-tailed deer was placed among the highly susceptible group. Next. And the second evidence is uh, experimental studies that demonstrated that these animals are not only susceptible, but they also efficiently transmit the virus among themselves. Next. And a serological um, survey conducted by USDA um, actually demonstrated natural exposure through antibody evidence of white-tailed deer infection in uh, four different states of uh, uh, the US. So therefore, all these three uh, pieces of evidence confirm that um, white-tailed deer are not only susceptible, but there is evidence for natural exposure, but we needed to provide the solid evidence of viral nucleic acid detection in uh, white-tailed deer. Next slide. So white-tailed deer are the most abundant large mammal species in North America. There are over 30 million um, of them, and they also contribute significantly through the economy of the US through uh, recreational activities and hunting. But most importantly, the, um, the unique um, ecology of these animals, the herd size and social structures and, and the, the migration patterns all impact um, the, the transmission dynamics of a respiratory virus if it were to um, circulate among these animals. Next slide. So we partnered with the uh, Iowa Department of Natural Resource, uh, leveraging their ongoing chronic wasting disease surveillance uh, where they collected retropharyngeal lymph nodes for monitoring for chronic wasting disease. And these samples were collected and stored um, and uh, we had this opportunity to uh, retrospectively go back in time and investigate if any of these white-tailed deer uh, were infected with SARS-CoV-2. So what you're seeing in this map is the, um, the map of Iowa with the uh, public lands laid. And you're going to see a series of black circles or red circles. And the black circles represent negative um, samples and the red circle represent positive. And we had a very precise um, GPS locations of these animals and also the time of collection. So we were able to um, locate them uh, both temporarily and geographically. Next. So uh, during uh, April to August of 2020, um, several samples we tested, all of them were negative as you see on the map with all uh, black dots next. And in September, we saw two positive uh, animals, but they are uh, in two separate locations within the state, which are over 200 miles apart, which indicates that these two are most likely to be independent events uh, because deer do not travel uh, that far. 
if you zoom into one of the locations next, um, so you see that there are lots of uh, negative animals and one positive animal, um, and then zoom back um, next to the next location, we zoom in uh, next, please. Uh, again, you see here um, lots of negative animals and one positive animal in September, uh, but as the time progresses, next slide, um, in October, we'll see one more positive animal uh, next. In November, there are a lot many uh, positive animals, as you see many, many red dots. Uh, next, uh, by December, there are a whole bunch of um, red dots, which represents that in that location, uh, the virus continued to spread and there are many, many positive animals within that location. Uh, next slide, if you zoom back and look at the, the overall picture of the entire state during the study period from April 2020 through January 21, there are a lot of uh, positive animals. Next. And um, next. And this makes the white-tailed deer the first identified free-living uh, animal uh, species um, that was infected to be, uh, found to be naturally infected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, next. And then interestingly, we were able to map the person positivity of uh, a deer and also with publicly available information of uh, human cases in Iowa that are mapped to the left-hand side y-axis here. The blue bars you see are the human cases. And at the peak of uh, um, human cases in Iowa during October, November, December nicely coincides with the peak of uh, person positivity among the deer. Next. And we also um, generated whole genome sequences of the deer SARS-CoV-2 isolates. And when we compared them with the publicly available SARS-CoV-2 genomes from humans, uh, from Iowa at that time, the lineages we found in the deer um, uh, uh, corresponded to the circulating SARS-CoV-2 lineages in humans at that time, which also further in, uh, emphasizes or, or, or confirms that the source of um, uh, um, virus to the deer is coming from humans. Next. And while this was a retrospective study, we, would, we do not know exactly how this may have happened, but there are many uh, ways in which this could potentially happen, perhaps through contaminated food source or contaminated environment, or also uh, a possible intermediary or bridging host cannot be ruled out, but we do not exactly know how deer may have gotten infected uh, uh, in this particular case. Next. Then we wanted to ask the question, what is currently happening uh, in 2022? So we were able to sample um, deer in Staten Island in New York City, uh, which is in the middle of uh, the city in, in Manhattan. And partnering with the city parks and uh, a white buffalo a conservation group, uh, we were able to collect uh, swab samples as well as blood, blood samples for serum from deer that are anesthetized and undergoing sterilization surgery. And what you're seeing here is the, the positive um, and negative uh, swab samples laid on the map of Staten Island. Uh, we found eight of the, the samples we tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 RNA. Next. Um, and when we did the whole genome sequence of those uh, positive samples, we found four of them belong to the Delta lineage, uh, Delta variant, and four of them were Omicron. And um, that makes this um, the first evidence of uh, uh, Omicron infection, natural infection of uh, a wild animal. Next slide. And when we looked at uh, um, the antibody uh, status of uh, many of these animals and the same location, uh, we found uh, multiple animals to be uh, positive for antibody by a surrogate virus neutralization assay, nearly 20% of them. And um, at least two of those animals that are tested positive for uh, viral RNA were also had antibody positive, which potentially indicates that like humans, deer may be susceptible for reinfection. Uh, and we, uh, although the study was not geared to look at the age distribution, uh, but we saw a high positivity among earlings uh, compared to fawns or adults. Next slide. And independent of our studies, our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania uh, found um, uh, an alpha lineage virus in, um, in white-tailed deer in, in Pennsylvania, where the virus was found to be um, diverged from its parent um, alpha lineage, which suggests that when the virus spills into an animal species and continues to circulate, uh, the virus is likely to change. Um, and 
uh, previous slide, please, sorry. Um, and um, a recent study from, uh, from Canada also suggested a highly mutated uh, white-tailed ear clade, as you see from this one next. And there are now um, three separate evidence of uh, animal to human transmission of SARS-CoV-2. The first one is uh, uh, mink to human transmission in Denmark. The second one is the transmission of virus from pet um, hamsters to humans in Hong Kong. And the more recent one is a single case of uh, uh, white-tailed ear clade positive human in Ontario, Canada, uh, that also is believed to be an animal-human transmission. Next. So the, the implications of uh, uh, unmonitored transmission of virus among any wildlife species is that there could be many potential pathways to which um, the virus can then infect humans. And as you see from this cartoon here, um, many animals in managed settings, especially households and retail stores with pets, could be a potential source of uh, spillback to humans. But what we do not know is the, the transmission networks among wild animals in their natural habitat, particularly white-tailed deer. What, what we do not know is who, who else they are giving the virus to. Uh, next slide. And therefore, it is really important to recognize that um, SARS-CoV-2 is a multi-species zoonosis, and we need to deal um, the virus um, as a um, uh, with a, with a one health approach, uh, where we consider both animal health, human health, and and uh, environmental health as intimately connected. Um, and uh, final slide, please. And just to recap, um, based on our studies and many other uh, publications, it is clear that there is widespread natural infection of white-tailed deer with SARS-CoV-2. And there are at least three documented cases of animal to human transmission. And then uh, it is really critical that we address um, the monitoring of uh, SARS-CoV-2 using a One Health approach. And in particular, uh, uh, targeted surveillance of high-risk animal species is critical so we better understand the ongoing evolution of the virus so we understand the potential risks to human through emergence of novel variants. Next slide. Finally, I would like to acknowledge um, many of our collaborators and colleagues that contributed to these studies, uh, our colleagues from Penn State and many other agencies that we work with, and also the, the funding agencies, including USDA and other, um, other entities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and thanks to all of today's speakers for your informative presentations. Next slide, please. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2022 slash may.html. We do have time for a few questions. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions and include the presenter's name or topic. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Negron. Um, we had a couple questions about uh, uh, your study and who would be eligible for that. Um, who would you categorize as being exposed to a rough strain of brucellosis? Um, for example, would an owner of an infected canine um, qualify for your study? Hi, um, yes, thank you for the questions. Um, yes. Um, if the dog has been confirmed with brucella canines, it will be um, the person will potentially qualify or we will be eligible to the um, to be included in the study. Um, I'm trying to scroll through my slides to look in particular for the eligibility criteria. So people with a known exposure to a rough brucella species, so it can be uh, brucella canines or brucella abortus RB51 or patients that have a Ralph Pusella species positive culture will be eligible for, for this study. Great, thank you. Um, and our next question is for Dr. Olgen and Dr. Cook. Um, were the lions and or other felines at this particular zoo vaccinated for SARS-CoV-2? No, the lions and other zoo cats were not vaccinated prior to the outbreak and still have not been vaccinated. But just last week, we did receive our first vial of the Zoetis pro product to vaccinate some of our susceptible species. The lions won't be the first to receive it. Uh, we're going to prioritize snow leopards and emir leopards. Thank you. 
Um, and another question for Dr. Negron, are labs read readily available to perform BCANIS culture and can culture be done in a BSL-2 or 3 lab? So BSL-2 practices containing equipment and facilities are recommended for routine handling of clinical specimens of human and animal origin. BSL-3 practices are recommended for all manipulations of cultures of pathogenic Brucella species. Um, there are also BSL-3 practices are also recommended when handling products of conception or clinical specimens that are suspected to contain Brucella. For more information, um, you can refer for, uh, to the biosafety microbiology microbiological and biomedical laboratories or the BMBL, the sixth edition that is available on the CDC website. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Kuchi Pudi. Um, your sample size, each sampling period increases over time. Was there an external reason for this and how much do you suspect it may have impacted your estimate of case numbers? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So um, I forgot to mention that um, the samples were a part of um, uh, ongoing surveillance. So typically, most of these samples come from roadkill uh, and also hunter killed samples. So therefore, uh, the most bulk of the samples come to the DNR through um, the hunting season. So you'll see that uh, there's a high number of samples during the, um, uh, the winter season. Um, so uh, while that may have an influence, but we clearly see that uh, that also coincides with the peak of uh, infection among humans during those uh, hunting season where we had the most samples. Thank you. Um, and another question for Dr. Olchen and Dr. Crook. Did the lions display clinical signs um, after initial resolution and during the prolonged fecal shedding? Uh, the intermittent sneezing resolved in all lions by about 20 days, and we didn't see any clinical signs after that. And we've just started to analyze the prolonged fecal shedding, so we don't yet know how long they're going to shed in feces, but we do know that they shed for months in their respiratory samples, but without clinical signs. Thank you. And another question for Dr. Kuchipudi. Um, do deer infected with SARS-CoV-2 present with any symptoms? Um, based on two separate experimental infection studies, uh, our current understanding is that uh, deer uh, do not show any noticeable clinical symptoms, clinical signs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and another question for Dr. Negron. Um, for Brucella canis, as the disease is incurable and zoonotic, is it recommended to euthanize animals that are diagnosed with this disease? And is it also recommended to cremate that animals that have had the disease? So as I, as I mentioned during the call, um, jurisdiction may have different laws as to how to handle these infected animals. Thus, we typically, what we recommend is that you contact your state public health veterinarian as to how to handle these specific situations because they, they, everything varies from state to state. Great, thank you. Um, and another uh, question for Dr. Olton and Dr. Have any other animals at the Hobo Zoo been um, diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2? No, we have had no other concerns for any other species for SARS-CoV-2. We have um, taken extensive staff precautions to, to safeguard our animals, but we have not done any additional testing, although we are participating in future surveillance. So we will be doing that either through swabs, feces, or serology with the Utah Department of Health. Thank you. We have time for um, one more question uh, for Dr. Kuchipudi. Is it possible that white-tailed deer and other wildlife species could be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 through municipal wastewater discharges to surface water bodies such as rivers? Yeah, that's a great question. So that is also one of the proposed sources for um, wild animals, particularly white-tailed deer. Uh, but we do not know exactly um, how much infectious virus um, really remains in the wastewater um, and the and the surface water. Uh, but that, that remains to be investigated. Uh, but that could be a, a possible source um, uh, to be determined. Thank you. Um, and if you have other questions for today's presenters, we have included their email addresses on this slide on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. A video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days. Next slide. Please join us for the next Zohu Call, which will be on June 1st, 2022. Thank you for your participation. This ends today's webinar.